Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for this program hosted by the Brennan Center for Justice, NYU's John Bradamus Center, and the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network at NYU School of Law. My name is Melissa Murray, and I am the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at NYU. I'm also a board member of the Brennan Center and the faculty director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. So this is like all of my worlds colliding tonight, which is why I am especially thrilled for this event, which brings together some of my other interests and one of my favorite authors. Tonight, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with Linda Greenhouse about her new book, Justice on the Brink, The Death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, The Rise of Amy Coney Barrett, and 12 Months That Transformed the Supreme Court. Before we get started with the conversation, just a few housekeeping notes. First, we will leave time at the end of this discussion for audience questions. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please do so using the YouTube chat function or the Facebook chat function. Second, civility is important to all of us at the Brennan Center. Those who are using rude or intemperate language in our message streams here on YouTube or on Facebook will be removed from the conversation. Thank you for your cooperation. Finally, we will be providing live closed captioning for those who need it. Finally, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to repair, revitalize, and when necessary, defend the systems of democracy and justice. And for tonight's program, we are delighted to be talking about one of the most important issues in our democracy, the future and fate of the United States Supreme Court. When Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away in September of 2020, then President Donald Trump immediately nominated Amy Coney Barrett to replace the court's leading liberal. Over the course of his four years in the White House, Trump succeeded in placing three justices on the court, cementing a conservative supermajority that would reshape the lives of Americans for a generation or more. From 2020 to 2021, the Supreme Court was at the center of major events the center of the pandemic, the presidential election, the Trump campaign's legal challenges, and finally, the January 6th Capitol riots. And key issues were being overseen by a court that was now decidedly more conservative than it had been just 10 years ago. Religious rights were elevated over questions of public health. The integrity of the presidential election and even state elections was at stake. And voting rights were under attack, as was Roe versus Wade a question that is especially poignant today when the Supreme Court took up oral arguments in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, a challenge to Mississippi HB 1510, and also a challenge that puts Roe versus Wade squarely in the court's crosshairs. To help us sort through these questions and the more existential questions facing the court, including whether Chief Justice John Roberts continues to lead the court that bears his name, or whether the new Trump appointees are steering the direction of this newly constituted conservative supermajority. To help us sort through all of that, we are delighted to be in conversation tonight with Linda Greenhouse, the author of Justice on the Brink. Linda is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who for over four decades has reported on the Supreme Court for the New York Times. She currently writes a bi-weekly op-ed column on law and teaches at Yale Law School. Her other books include Becoming Justice Blackman, The Burger Court and the Rise of the Judicial Right, and Before Roe versus Wade, Voices that Shape the Divorcing Debate Before the Supreme Court's Ruling. Welcome to the program, Linda. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I always like talking to you, Melissa. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, and what a day for us to talk about this fantastic book. So, Maybe we should start by taking a step backwards. Um, the book is going to get into so many things, but um, one of the things I thought was very interesting is that when the book came out a few weeks ago, a number of critics praised your amazing facility with the case law, your ability to make the case law accessible to lay readers, and, and all of that is true. But one in particular uh, noted that you seem to perhaps have overstated the reach of the book, the idea that this was a completely transformed court, one that was poised to take American jurisprudence in a decidedly conservative direction in ways that would be cataclysmic for the American public. According to that particular critic, uh, the 2021 term for the court really did not see those kinds of cataclysmic events. Instead, what we saw in his view 
um, were more moderate consensus oriented opinions where the court struck narrow balances between the right and the left. I wonder what you make of that particular critique on an evening like this one after a morning of very intense debate over abortion at the high court. Yeah, I, I found that review by a Harvard law professor. Uh, I wasn't going to name names. But. I'm not naming names. There's a male Harvard law professor. Uh, because, of course, anyone who really knows the court, which I assume such a person does, knows that one of its real powers is to set its own agenda. And in setting its own agenda, of course, it's setting our agenda, the, the, the social, political, legal agenda for the country. So two of the agenda setting moves the court made last spring, uh, the first term, of course, with Amy Coney Barrett, the first term with the three Trump justices, the, the subject of my book, was to decide to hear the Mississippi abortion case, the state's appeal from a decision of the most conservative appeals court in the country that had overturned its the Mississippi law, which bans abortion after 15 weeks, flagrantly unconstitutional under current law. So the question is, is current law going to survive? And also the court granted review in the New York gun case, the, the first Second Amendment case, major Second Amendment case that's going to hear since the court decided in the Heller decision that the Second Amendment conveys an individual right to keep a gun at home for self-defense. And the question in the New York case is, uh, under what conditions can somebody be authorized to walk around with a concealed weapon? So those are two things that the court did last spring uh, that never would have happened had the three Trump justices not been serving on the court. So. Why do I say that? Well, the red states, the red state legislatures have been enacting tons of gun laws and abortion laws, restrictions on abortion. The court, the abortion restrictive laws have been consistently struck down by every federal appeals court because those courts, of course, are bound by Supreme Court precedent. Why take the Mississippi case? Because they want to change the law. And that really came through in the two hours of incredibly intense argument this morning that was live streamed, broadcast, not visually, but uh, the audio was out there. Everybody can listen to it and the transcript is on the court's website. Everybody can, can read it. And um, that's a direct outgrowth of what happened in the court's last term. So what did you make of this morning's oral argument? Um, was this the court that you envisioned really pushing rights over the edge? If 2021 had been mere table setting for what was to come, was this the actual buffet at which the court's conservatives were finally going to feast? Uh, this was the, the whole meal with candlesticks and champagne. This was the culmination of a decades long project. Uh, you know, Ed, Ed Meese, the uh, former attorney general, had an op-ed the other day in the Washington Post, and he said, if the court fails to overturn Roe against Wade, it means the conservative legal movement has failed. And I read that and I thought, wow, what a sad statement. I mean, is that all the conservative legal movement has stood for for almost 50 years? Well, whether it stood for that or stood for a few other things on top of it, that's what we saw playing out in, in the court this morning. Uh, I cannot count five votes to retain the right to abortion. Uh, I think I count five votes to flatly overturn Roe against Wade and Casey against Planned Parenthood. And um, I thought I was beyond getting surprised, let alone shocked in anything that the court does, but I found I found the argument pretty shocking, actually. What did you find shocking in particular? Well, the, the chief justice, for one thing, who is somebody who is in very, very tight control of his public persona and usually is, uh, you know, almost maddeningly neutral on the bench, he radiated hostility toward the Supreme Court's presence. I mean, it was just clear. That was one. Amy Coney Barrett um, went down a road that I never would have predicted anybody would go down, actually. She started talking about 
what are called safe haven laws. And under those laws, uh, if somebody has a baby that they don't want to keep within a specified period of time, a day or two, they can basically leave the baby in a basket at a police station or a hospital and um, walk away. And what Justice Barrett said, I actually have the transcript here. I can read it. She says, um, well, I should, I should back up a second. One of the arguments uh, for retaining the right to abortion is that women in today's world need the right to structure their lives so that they can be full participants in whatever aspect of life they want. And if they decide that being a mother would interfere with that, uh, they have a right to terminate a pregnancy. But she, but Justice Barrett says to um, Julie Rickleman, who is representing the Mississippi abortion clinic that brought the challenge to the Mississippi ban. She said, I have a question about the safe haven laws. Oh, I'm very sorry. That's a phone ringing and I'm going to step away for a second and hang up. Well, let me pick it up. Um, so one of the things that Justice, that Justice Barrett seemed to be suggesting was that now that there's the prospect of infant safe haven laws where women can relinquish their newborns, um, they aren't necessarily burdened by parenthood. And so the fact that you can avoid the demands of parenthood and raising a child suggests that the fact of an abortion restriction is not constitutionally burdensome in a way that the court is obliged to address. Is that a fair statement? Yes, yeah, so the way she puts it, she says, I have a question about the safe haven laws. Uh, you can terminate parental rights by relinquishing the child after, afterward. I think, uh, she says, it seems to me, both Roe and Casey emphasize the burdens of parenting. And insofar as you and many of your amici focus on the ways in which forced parenting, forced motherhood, would hinder women's access to the workplace and to equal opportunities, it's also focused on the consequences of parenting. Why don't the safe haven laws take care of that problem? It seems to me that it focuses the burden much more narrowly. Well, in other words, she's she's disaggregating the fact of pregnancy and the fact of motherhood, saying, "Oh, you can you can go through with childbirth and leave the baby on in a basket on a doorstep, and what is your problem?" And this is a woman who gave birth to five children, adopted two more, and she's basically saying, "I did it." And look at me, I made it all the way to the Supreme Court. What about this is problematic? And I just, you know, the kind of lack of self-awareness that would posit, that, that would fail to understand that the notion of coercing a woman who does not want to be a mother to go through nine months of pregnancy, give birth, and then say, well, you can leave the baby in a basket. What is your problem? I, 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 just, I, I just found that a shocking line of inquiry. Well, and she pursued it again with Solicitor General Prelogger later. Um, and it reminded me, um, what before Justice Barrett was nominated to fill Justice Ginsburg's seat, she had been much discussed as a potential replacement for Justice Kennedy. And in fact, Ramesh Ponaru, the conservative pundit, had written in an op-ed for Bloomberg that she should be the pick because when the time came for the court to get to its sort of inevitable confrontation, with Roe versus Wade, it would be vitally important for the court that overruled Roe to not do so with every woman on the court in dissent. So his point was that she was needed as a woman to perhaps provide some feminine legitimacy. And in this moment, this morning, she not only provided feminine legitimacy, she really leaned into her own experience of maternity to basically ask why abortion rights were necessary for any woman if there was the possibility of surrendering a child for adoption, a path that she herself had once selected. Yeah, it, it, it was breathtaking. And um, of course, my book starts out with the, the image of Amy Barrett and Donald Trump up there on the Truman balcony uh, in that night in October after she was confirmed. Uh, you know, he had, Trump had nominated her before Ruth Ginsburg was even buried. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the shocking speed of it. Uh, the kind of inevitability of it. You know, the night that Ruth Ginsburg died, September 18th, uh, we learned later, uh, Mitch McConnell placed a call to President Trump, who was on Air Force One coming back from a campaign 
stop. And McConnell said to him, uh, you're going to do two things. You're going to fill the vacancy and you're going to fill it with Amy Coney Barrett. So there it was, you know. I mean, the election was already underway, the 2020 election in states with early voting. People were, millions of Americans had voted by the time of this, of this nomination. And her record uh, before she became a judge, she was one of Donald Trump's early um, appointees to the federal appeals court in the spring of 2017. Before she became a judge and had to be more tempered about things, uh, she had expressed extreme hostility to the right to abortion. And, you know, there she was getting confirmed and nobody could really ask that question. That was one of the things that was not, uh, you know, you don't, you, you, you can't ask a nominee to sort of commit or, or, or non-commit on the question. And so it was kind of danced around with various um, dog whistles and winks and so on. Um, but here we have it. So Justice Barrett is obviously a key player in the story that you are weaving about the court's most recent term and what it means for the court's future. But another equally important player here is the Chief Justice himself. And uh, the picture you paint is one that's incredibly complicated. Um, he is the man for whom this court is named. It's known as the Roberts Court. But the picture that you paint is one where he seems to be losing control of the conservative bloc. Um, and he certainly, I think, parted ways with some of the more stalwart members of the court's conservative bloc, namely Justices Alito and Gorsuch. Um, what do you see in terms of how the Chief Justice will navigate, how he navigated last term, and what it's going to mean for him to navigate this term? And did we see anything from him today that gives us any indication of what the path forward looks like? Well, he was the only member of the court who seemed at all interested, actually, in the question that the court had agreed to decide in the Mississippi case, and that was a question of fetal viability. So just to to provide the context. So viability has been the, the firewall ever since Roe, 1973, that has protected the right to abortion. Whatever the court has done, the court has said in later cases, you know, you can make a woman jump through various hoops. You can make her listen to a, you know, very biased uh, so-called informed consent statement. You can require her to do this and that. But at the end of the day, before fetal viability, she has an absolute right to decide to terminate the pregnancy. The Mississippi law banning abortion after 15 weeks, which was months before viability, obviously violates that. And that's the question the court had agreed to decide. The court agreed to decide explicitly the question, does a ban on abortion before viability, uh, can, can it ever, does it violate the constitution flatly? Or is there any exception? Only John Roberts seemed interested in exploring that. But the way he explored it made it quite clear that um, he actually doesn't think viability uh, is a legitimate firewall or is any kind of firewall because he, he asked the, the Mississippi lawyer, uh, Scott Stewart, the Solicitor General of Mississippi, he said, you know, was viability even an issue in, in, in Roe against Wade? And didn't Justice Blackman in his private papers, which unfortunately, the Chief Justice said, you know, are, are open to the world, uh, say that, you know, he chose viability as kind of an arbitrary cutoff. That was really a, a weird uh, line of inquiry because, um, you know, whatever Justice Blackman said in his private papers or, you know, in a letter to his best friend or in his diary, that's not material that one mm -hmm. actually cites in a judicial opinion, but Leaving that aside, what he obviously was trying to do was delegitimize viability and kind of play around with the notion of why do we even have such a concept in our abortion laws. So, you know, on the one hand, it seemed he might be interested in drawing some kind of intermediate line. But as I read the transcript and, and thought about the implications of what he actually said, I think he's got to be fully on board the project which is overturn Roe, overturn Casey. So 
where does this leave everything else? I mean, so it, it seems obvious to everyone that the Mississippi law will be upheld. I think the question is whether we will have a nuclear option overruling Roe versus Wade or the evisceration of viability, which though less nuclear than overruling Roe would still be a sweeping change to the reproductive rights landscape and would give states wide latitude to regulate abortion in ways that would have enormous complications and implications for access. What other issues are on the brink, as you say here? What else should we be looking for as the court goes into this really fraught October 21 term? Yeah, I think the two big issues that are currently on the table, and I'm setting aside affirmative action because that's a big issue the court has not yet agreed to decide. That's inevitable, whether in the Harvard case that's pending or some other case, uh, we'll, we'll see about that. But are, is the Second Amendment and the religion clauses of the First Amendment, specifically the free exercise guarantee of the First Amendment. So we mentioned the gun case already. It was argued uh, last month, early November, uh, and it seemed pretty clear that the New York law, which uh, is one of the stricter laws in the country about licensing somebody to carry a concealed weapon is not going to survive its encounter with the court. So that opens a whole line of questions because the Heller opinion itself really was limited to keeping a gun at home for self-defense. Mm -hmm. The court in all these years, Heller was in uh, 2008, has not expanded that understanding of the Second Amendment, which has been uh, very annoying to Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch, who've been complaining. Uh, we're treating the Second Amendment like a second-class right. We've got to take one of these cases. And, uh, you know, so something finally gelled in the term I'm writing about, and they decided to, to take that. Religion is a huge issue. The first indication last term that something dramatic had changed, came within a couple weeks of Justice Barrett going on the court, replacing Justice Ginsburg. And this was one of the many cases that came before the court, several cases, uh, involving the public health limitations on the number of people who could gather in indoor spaces as a way of trying to limit the spread of the COVID pandemic. Uh, with, when Justice Ginsburg was still alive in the spring and early summer of 2020, churches had brought challenges to these limitations, and the court had rejected the challenges by a vote of five to four, the chief justice and the then four liberals to his left. Amy Barrett comes on the court, substituting for Justice Ginsburg. The first case that comes up is Thanksgiving Eve last year, a challenge to the capacity limitations in New York. And um, right away, the court flipped five to four, rejected the limitation. And by the end of the term, had rejected the limitations in a couple more cases, uh, including one at the end of the term from California that really showed us how far, the, how far down the road the court has gone to privileging religious claims above all other claims, including the claims of public health. And uh, you, you remember this case, I think it's a case called Tandon. Yeah. Ms. Newsom came up on the court shadow docket. The court didn't even bother to grant review and have full briefing and argument. It was one of these late night things. And it was a, a challenge to a, a California regulation that said that in a private home, uh, no more than three unrelated people, unrelated groups, couples, something like that, it was a small number, uh, could gather. Uh, for whatever reason, have a birthday party, have a prayer service, have whatever. Re religion wasn't on the table. Two individuals sued and said, we use our homes for religious purposes. We have a prayer meeting, we have a Bible study meeting, and this regulation discriminates against religion. The district court judge said, no, it doesn't. You can't have more than X number of people in your home for any reason. There's nothing about religion that's in this regulation. Treated exactly the same. The Ninth Circuit upheld that. The challenge was, oh yeah, but you let people in the mall. You let people, you know, go do their grocery shopping, but you don't let them gather in their home for religion. So that's discrimination against religion. It's a, really a mix up of the, the yeah. comparators. 
but the court um, struck down the regulation that said this is a discrimination against religion because some other activity out there in the world is being treated better than religion. And we can't have that. Religion has to have has to be treated as, as favorably as anything else. And, and so uh, that's, where, that's where the term left us. And there's a big religion case that's going to be argued next week, actually. And, um, and we'll see. I think that it's a pretty foreordained outcome that religion is going to prevail in that case, too. Well, so the case that you are alluding to is Carson versus Macon, which is a challenge to a main policy that um, allows for the state to subsidize private schools because there aren't enough public schools in some of the more rural areas of the state. And so the challenge is to the fact that those public subsidies are not available for sectarian schools, um, schools that are religious in nature. And the question is whether they can be extended to also include religious schools. So this would obviously have really important implications for school voucher programs, things of that nature. Um, but I raise it because it reminds me of a case, I think from October term 2016, um, Trinity Lutheran versus Comer, which was about um, a public program for resurfacing playgrounds using old tires. And a church, Trinity Lutheran, had applied for the program, had been rejected on the ground, that the state did not subsidize religious entities. Um, and the court, which included a majority of that included some of the liberal members of the court, agreed to allow the free exercise clause to be deployed in such a way to permit the church to participate in this program and said the state had to include the church as well. Um, the picture that you paint in the book is that the conservative legal movement has been very slowly laying breadcrumbs and very tidily tending their their crops for some time and now they're all sort of blossoming and and coming to fruition why did the liberals allow this kind of first amendment husbandry to happen on their watch i mean justice Breyer was in that majority in trinity lutheran yeah and justice ginsburg was not that's true uh, uh i think uh not to put too fine a point on it i think they got snooker and uh i think it was at their insistence, they being Justice Breyer, Justice Kagan. Um, the Chief Justice put a really strange footnote yes. in that case. He said, we're only talking about tires being used to resurface playgrounds. We're not talking about anything else. We're just talking about a church that was ruled ineligible for this subsidy uh, because of its identity as a church. And he said, that kind of discrimination is odious to the Constitution. Well, so. Then comes the next case, uh, which was a case decided two years ago. Yes. This is a project. This is part of the Chief Justice's project. And it was another one of these, uh, can the state be required to subsidize uh, tuition through, that was a, a voucher case um, from, uh, from Montana. Montana. Yeah. And the Chief Justice said, uh, yeah, what about the Trinity Lutheran case? Don't you understand? These religious schools are being discriminated against, not because of anything they do, not because of any use they would put the money to, but because of their identity. Now, Justice Gorsuch, to his credit, wrote a separate opinion in that case. It's a case called Espinoza, in which he said, when you're talking about a religious school, there's no difference between identity and use. The reason it's a religious school is because they want to instruct students in, they want to inculcate the religious doctrine in their students. That's why they exist. But the holding of that case is that was simply about identity, not about use. Now this case comes and it's about use. Mm -hmm. It's the next step. It's the final step uh, because there's no doubt that the religious schools that are claiming a right to the tuition subsidy in the state of Maine um, they make no bones about it. They're religious schools and they want to teach religion, which obviously is their perfect right. Uh, the question is, do they have a right to do it with public money? And that's a big bridge to, to cross. The court's been inching up to it. Uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, there were big fights about what used to be called parochial aid. And the, there was a kind of a settlement. And the settlement was, uh, government can subsidize the bus transportation, the math books, the other secular textbooks, 
uh, can give release time from the public schools so that students can go and get their religious education uh, elsewhere. Uh, that settlement is now has has obviously flown apart, and so the question now isn't may a state subsidize religious education, but rather must a state under a free exercise First Amendment claim must the state subsidize religious education, and that's the threshold we're at. In this case, from Maine, this Carson against Macon case was granted in the term that I'm writing about, and. And religion really on um, the step-by-step the -step nature of the court's project on this side of the, the religion clauses, forget the establishment clause, that's been basically erased. Um, it's, it's really a, a major theme of the last term of the court that's now coming, as you said, now coming to fruition. So I hope all of you at home are enjoying this conversation with Linda as much as I am. We would love to get your questions for Linda. So please feel free to put those in the YouTube chat function or the Facebook chat function, and I'll incorporate them when we get to the Q&A portion of tonight's event. Um, but Linda, back to um, some of the personalities on the court. Um, I just mentioned Justice Breyer. He, of course, is a central figure in your narrative about this term because he, of course, is in a similar position that Justice Ginsburg was once in. Um, that is, he is a justice who is perhaps at the end of his tenure on the court, or perhaps should be at the end of his tenure of the court, on the court. There is a Democratic president. There is a thin Democratic majority in the Senate. And lots of people are looking to him to step down. And he seems to show no interest in doing so. Why do you think he has been so recalcitrant about the prospect of stepping down? Is it for the same reasons that Justice Ginsburg decided not to step down when she was invited to do so by President Obama? Or are there other things at work here? Well, I think just part of Justice Breyer's whole project in recent years has been, you know, to kind of fight against the obvious and, and uh, hope that people don't view the court as simply a political agent. And, and his feeling, and I think actually his feeling about this was reinforced by the, I think, kind of ham-handed effort by the, um, uh, the liberal professoriate to get him to retire, is that if he retired under that kind of pressure, it would just uh, validate all the fears about the court becoming just a political agent. So um, I think that backfired. And... Uh, you know, so he, he decided not, not to retire and, and uh, uh, you know, people are still wringing their hands about it, but um, under our system with life tenure, that's completely up to him. Well, so is he in the same position that Justice Ginsburg was in? Because I mean, again, her failing to step down when she did led to this sort of consequential six to three conservative supermajority. We already have a conservative supermajority. Um, is it that much more damage if Justice Breyer fails to step down in time and a Republican president appoints yet another conservative justice to fill his seat? Well, you know, there are many ways to look at it. I mean, I kind of push back against people who blame Ruth Ginsburg for the state that we're in because uh, there were so many contingencies that have brought us to the point we are, you know, how about Mitch McConnell blockading the Scalia vacancy. How about uh, the American public uh, responding to the to the existence of the Scalia vacancy by electing Donald Trump? Uh, you know all, all those things. So, um, uh, you know, is is there less at stake now with a potential prior vacancy and a potential loss of the Senate in the midterms or? A Republican president getting elected uh, in, in 2024. You know, I I don't know. I mean, I suppose the argument is well, uh, somebody much younger than Breyer uh -huh. would be replaced and would stay on the court for many more decades and anchor in that conservative majority. Um, you know, these are all considerations that I've kind of stayed away from trying to uh, make the mistake that I think a lot of people have made. In try to tell him what to do. Oh, fair enough. Um, 
do you do you think that the looming specter of this Supreme Court commission is something that he thinks about or that his colleagues think about as they weigh how they go about their jobs? Today, it seemed like no one seemed to care about the prospect of talk of court reform. Um, but earlier in the years, around September, after the court refused to intervene in SB8, um, the justices did seem concerned that the public viewed them as overly partisan or somehow captured by a particular ideological concern. Um, do you think the prospect of structural reform of the court or any kind of report from the Supreme Court Commission is something that weigh on the justices? Well, if it's weighing on them, they have a very strange way of uh, manifesting their concern because, uh, of course, the moment at which the uh, public approval of the court seemed to plummet was the beginning of September when the court allowed the vigilante law in Texas SB8 to take effect without bothering to hear arguments or anything. Um, of course, uh, correlation is not causation, but I think many people assume that the Texas law being allowed to go into effect had something to do with the fact that the public approval rating of the court and the Gallup poll plummeted from something in the high 50s to 40 uh, percent. But, you know, if, if the court cared about that, uh, they might have been when the, when the second uh, challenge to the Texas law came in a few weeks later, um, they could have issued an in the requested injunction against the Texas law. So I, I don't see much evidence that other than kind of rhetorically um, mm -hmm. that they have all that much concern. And maybe not even rhetorically, I mean, Justice Barrett did go to the McConnell Center at the University of Louisville, named for the same Mitch McConnell who is so instrumental in her appointment, to disclaim the idea that uh, she and her colleagues were partisan hacks. Um, optics might have looked better if it hadn't been the McConnell Center and if Mitch McConnell had not been with her on the dais when she said that. Um, what should we make of the two other women on the court? Um, how do Justices Sotomayor and Justice K Justices Sotomayor and Kagan sort of interact with their colleagues on the right and with Breyer, who seems to be more willing to move between these two different camps. Yeah, I mean, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan are very different in the way they're approaching their job. Uh, if people want to see like the very, very best of Sonia Sotomayor, um, tune into the audio. Of, yeah. of the argument this morning. I mean, she was quite fabulous in calling out everything that needed to be called out in the Mississippi case. Uh, not because she thought she was going to change any votes, I, I believe, but because she was making a record. She's going to write a dissenting opinion that will speak to history. And that, I think, is, is how she sees her role on the court at, at this time. Justice Kagan, it's not that that's not her. She thinks with the force of her very considerable intellect and mastery of material, she may be able to, if not change a vote, at least maybe modify, moderate a vote. And so she's, I think, more willing to kind of put a hand out and work with uh, her colleagues on the other side of the street. And as far as I know, she may have made some inroads. I mean, there have been some decisions in recent years that didn't go as far to the right as one might have expected. So she's got her kind of long range uh, strategy. But I don't mean to suggest that she's kind of, you know, a, a kind of a mushy moderate person. I mean, she's capable of writing uh, extremely compelling dissenting opinions as she did at the end of the term uh, this summer in the uh, Arizona voting rights case. That was you know, one of her all time best dissenting opinions, but they, but they, uh, they carry themselves differently um, mm -hmm. in the, you know, within SCOTUS world, I'd say. I think that's that's fair to say as well. Um, she, Justice Kagan was more muted today um, and, and almost seemed a little shocked by what sort of unfolded. Um, like she didn't ask many questions. I think she too might have been surprised by the tenor of the conversation. I, maybe so, or maybe, uh, you know, Justice Sotomayor was so forceful. Maybe she yeah. kind of took the air out of the, the left-hand side of the bench. Um, 
Well, well Justice Kagan had been quite um, expressive in the oral arguments in SB8 just a few weeks ago. So maybe they're tag teaming and they know this is a marathon and not a sprint and they have to team up. Yeah, or maybe they had agreed, uh, you know, that, that Justice Sotomayor would sort of take the, the laboring or I mean, who, who knows? But yeah, she, she was kind of surprisingly quiet, but we, we, we haven't heard the last from her, that's for sure. Well, you know who's not quiet? Our audience members are not quiet, and they have lots of questions for you. So the first question um, is about Justice Kavanaugh, who we've not spoken about. Um, what did you think about Justice Kavanaugh's suggestion today in oral argument that the court should be, quote unquote, neutral with respect to abortion? I Personally, I thought it was uh, ridiculous. I, basically, he was saying, well, there's a big dispute going on. Some people think this, some people think that, so the court should just be neutral. Excuse me, we've got 50 years of precedent here. We've got major individual rights at stake. Uh, you know, ne neutrality, as he phrased it, would mean taking away from the women of America a right that has protected their personal autonomy for 50 years. I don't get the notion of neutrality. Uh, you know, the world wasn't made new on December 1st when the court heard argument in this case. We've got, we've got history. And um, I thought it was a rather typical Brett Kavanaugh move. I, we've, we've seen this before where he will try to frame an issue in a very kind of superficially attractive way, a very moderate seeming way. But we're, just, we're just talking about neutrality. And then he went on with that list of earlier cases in which the court had overturned precedent. You know, it's just normal to overturn precedent. I mean, what's wrong with overturning Plessy against Ferguson? I mean, we just overturn precedents whenever we think something's wrong. So, you know, these are move, these are theatrical moves, uh, but he's um, he's going to be exactly in the same camp as the rest of people on his side of the street. That's what I think. And, and ultimately, the point of that neutrality argument is he wants Roe overturned and the question of abortion to be returned to the states to decide for themselves how to do this. Um, and uh, if not, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You say neutrality is a meaningless word in the actual context in which he was using it. Well, so, so with that in mind, um, has there ever been a circumstance where the court has saw fit to overturn a right that had previously been extended? All of the cases that he mentioned where decisions had been overruled had actually been about extending or elaborating rights, not withdrawing them. You're exactly right. I mean, I think there, I think you could find cases in the, you know, commercial area or like a long time ago where, uh, you know, rights that had been recognized or asserted were, were, were cut back or something. But when it comes to a major individual right, all the overturning of precedents have been in one direction, in the direction of rights expansion, not rights withdrawal. And that's just a fact. And, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do, but they cannot pretend that this is a normal thing to do. How rare is it for the court to overrule a prior decision? It's not totally rare. I mean, it, if it's maybe once or twice a term, the um, the Library of Congress keeps a running list of, of them, and it's you know it's it's, it's mm -hmm. anonymous actually. Um, but something of, I mean, the, a lot of the arguments today actually went to this point as to whether. Well, there's something special about overturning a precedent that not only has been maybe sitting there for a few years or whatever, but a precedent that's been it's been fully considered and reaffirmed in the full light of day, and that's Casey. That's mm -hmm. against Casey, where the three Republican appointed justices who formed the, the nucleus of the five to four outcome. In Casey, when the court refused to overturn Roe, said, we may not have endorsed, voted with the majority in Roe against Wade as an original matter had we been on the court in 1973, but that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is, what do we do about it today? And does 
the question of overturning it meet our usual criteria for when we overturn a prior decision? And these Republican appointed justices said the answer to that question is no. And of course, that's the same question today. But the justices, the conservative justices were acting as if, oh, we're asked to write the law of abortion today, December 1st, 2021. There's no history. There's no past except for some mistake that unaccountably was made 50 years ago. And we're here to rectify that. It was a very, uh, something very bizarre about that argument. So where would this leave us? Um, if the court is poised to either uphold the Mississippi law or uphold the Mississippi law and overrule Roe versus Wade, we have the expansion of free exercise rights. We have the expansion of corporate rights, limits on the role of unions to organize. What does this leave of the progressive legal project that had been in place from the Warren court forward? Well, of course, there's been a great asymmetry for decades in how much attention progressives and conservatives have paid to the courts. I mean, it's very fascinating. Progressives have had a broad agenda, uh, much of which uh, they wanted to achieve by legislation. Uh, conservatives not being able to muster a majority for their legislative projects have turned to the courts. And, uh, you know, progressives have been kind of asleep at the switch. I mean, look at how kind of diffident both uh, President Clinton and President Obama were about uh, filling vacancies that they inherited or that uh, occurred during their tenure. I have to say, people aren't giving President Biden enough credit for how um, enthusiastically he is mm -hmm. filling those vacancies which he has to fill. I think he's now in round 10 of, of judicial appointments and there are really some fabulous appointments there and, and, and his people are getting confirmed. So, uh, you know, he, he was head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He understands that and his chief of staff, Ron Klain, who was his chief of staff in the Senate, understands that. And it's really a great, a great difference. But, um, you know, so what did progressive do now that the courts are, have been lost? Uh, any of them, um, they've got to play the same long game that conservatives played. And conservatives won that game in politics by getting people elected who would carry it out and exercise their constitutional authority to nominate and confirm people to the courts who would do what they wanted them to do. And that's the situation we're in right now. And the prospect of that seems a little distant right now. I mean, basically, you have progressives who seem a little disenchanted with the president and his agenda. There's discussions about whether there's enthusiasm gap among Democrats going into the midterm elections. And this is probably not the moment to have an enthusiasm gap. Like, we probably need to have an enthusiasm surplus at this point, because without the Senate, nothing is going to happen going forward and likely without the house as well. And so how do progressives sort of get on board and you know, what do people in the progressive legal community, what can they do to sort of make the situation somewhat more, um, somewhat less dystopic? Well, I think they might want to spend less time on, you know, perseverating about what should be done about the Supreme court and, uh, and work in politics and make sure that they keep hold of the Senate and, um, you know, try to either prevent bad things from happening in the Senate or, or help good things to happen. That, that's almost counterintuitive, Linda. Um, you know, to, to get back the courts, forget about them and work in the other branches for a while. I, I think that's, you know, I mean, get some strong voting rights protection. Mm -hmm. Get some protection for reproductive freedom. It can be done by legislation. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can be done. Um, I think the focus on, you know, should we add people to the court? Should we do this and that about the court? That's not the, that's not where the answer lies. We've got to, you know, get down 
you know, we've got to worry about redistricting and gerrymandering. The court's not going to save us from that. They told us that. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's good old fashioned politics, I think. So it's good old fashioned politics um, and we shouldn't really be focused on the courts. The courts are lost at least for the next couple of years to us. And so we should be focused on politics. Should we be concerned that justice is on the brink? Like, is there anything that we can do in this moment to save what is left of this progressive legal agenda? Well, I guess I'm kind of with, with Sonia Sotomayor. I think we need to keep a very close watch. We need to record. We need to use our voices as she does. Um, you know, we got to speak to history and history will judge this period. Um, you know, I think history will judge the last presidential administration pretty harshly. How history judges the Supreme Court's response to it and uh, what, what the court is on, on the verge of doing. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see, but it's um, it's not a very encouraging prospect. Um, to the extent that there are individuals who think that structural reform or court-centered reforms are important, um, what do you make of President Biden striking this Supreme Court commission that is not intended to make recommendations, but instead is simply supposed to report on the state of the Supreme Court and the prospect of its jurisdiction going forward? Well, I think it's, you know, I haven't read what the commission's doing. Um, I think it's useful to have the kind of conversation that the commission has engendered. I have read actually a lot of the testimony um, mm -hmm. and there's several rounds of public hearings and, you know, it's been enlightening. I, I think, um, you know, part of, part of what's enabled the conservative movement to be as successful as it has been is that <clears throat> People haven't paid sufficient attention right. uh, to what's been going on in the courts, and 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 now a, a broader public is is it sufficient? I don't, I don't know, um, but I don't, I don't fault President Biden either for setting up the commission or for saying, uh, you know, I don't want it to tell me what to do. I wanted to air all the issues. Mm -hmm. I want a broad group of I think there's thirty or so members of the commission from. A broad spectrum. Uh, I, I'm interested in hearing what they have to say, and they're going to be speaking as much to the public as to me. And uh, you know, maybe it's a first step in getting some more thoughtful and and, and broader gauged um, examination of these of these issues. And you know, to that extent, I think it's good, and we'll see what they come up with. So in the book, you chronicle some of the highlights of last term, as well as some of the lowlights, some of the things that um, were decisions that will really have deep, deep repercussions going forward for questions of religious rights, um, reproductive rights, all of that. Is there a sort of sleeper case that kind of went under the radar that no one really talked about that you think will actually have really broad implications and we should be paying attention to? Well, one case that I think didn't get the attention that it really merited was the big property rights case. Yeah. Cedar Point. And the term case called Cedar Point. That, like so much else he, that we've talked about, was the culmination of a long project. It actually was Justice Scalia's project. And when he died in 2016, he died with <clears throat> that project unfulfilled. And, and what he wanted to do was to... Um, changed the way the court looked at what what is a quote taking a term of art under mm -hmm. under the Fifth amendment government cannot take private property uh, without due compensation and the court the the governing precedence in that is that an absolute taking meant a real physical taking a physical invasion like eminent domain that kind of thing mm -hmm. anything else was deemed a so-called regulatory taking and was subject to a balancing test about uh, what's the extent of the regulatory burden, what's you know you, what's the purpose of it. We balance these various factors. What the Cedar Point case did was break down that wall between the per se taking and the regulatory taking, and said that uh, in California law that allowed union organizers to go onto uh, farms 
before the workday and after the workday to try to organize the farm workers uh, it was an absolute per se taking by the state of private property, even though you know no property obviously was changing hands and there was no interference with the business model of these um, agribusiness entities. Uh, but that's a taking. And that was really a, a, a major step that, as Justice Breyer said in, in dissent, opened all, a real can of worms about all kinds of government regulation uh, where government inspectors go on private property to look for violations of, you know, mine safety, worker safety, yeah. all kinds of things. And, and what about that? And uh, we'll see what about that. But that was really a, a major step that um, I think maybe you agree, uh, you know, ended up under the radar of, of people's attention. Well, I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I don't think it got a lot of play last term, but it really was quite sweeping, the, like had immediate repercussions for union organizers, but ostensibly would have repercussions for any kind of government agency that has to go on to property. Uh, it really makes the whole prospect of regulation much more difficult um, on the employer's property. Uh, so we have time for one final question before we end. And the question comes from one of our audience members. Um, they are so enjoying this conversation, has so enjoyed the book, and they'd like to know what's the best way for individuals, whether they are journalists or not, to stay updated about what goes on in and around the Supreme Court. So what's in your media diet as you stay one of the nation's most avid court watchers? Well, of course, the court's website is actually pretty user-friendly these days. And um, all the resources that somebody needs uh, to follow the court are, on, are up on the website. Of course, they can listen to Strict Scrutiny, your podcast. <laughs> Um, Thank you for the plug. Appreciate it. They can, uh, you know, they can follow SCOTUS blog, which is a, a, a free website. Um, you know, when when I was first considering whether to embark on this project of writing of writing the book, my my first thought was, you know, I, it's the pandemic. I'm not going to be in Washington. I'm not going to be at the court. How how can I really, you know, do this? And then I thought, nobody's at the court. The court was closed because of the pandemic. The justices were conducting their arguments by telephone. And everything I need is going to be on the website. Mm -hmm. um, so that's true. You know, it takes a little work. But, um, you know, for instance, in the abortion case that was argued today, there were 140 briefs filed. Yeah. Now, I cannot sit here and say I read 140 briefs. I certainly did not. And I can't say the justices did either, for that matter. Uh, so, you know, you have to learn how to navigate the resources that are available, um, but they are definitely available. So that's a good place to stop. So the court has a very user-friendly website. You will find um, audio of the live streamed oral arguments. You'll also find transcripts usually on the same day that the oral argument happens. So um, that's Supreme Court or supremecourt.gov. If, uh, I believe the address says it's easy to Google. Um, and then there are all of these other resources like SCOTUS blog and a number of podcasts, including Strict Scrutiny, but not limited to Strict Scrutiny that are available. Um, but Linda, this has been such a fascinating conversation. Um, it was such a great treat to be able to read this book and to reflect on last term. And again, if you haven't read Linda's other work on the Supreme Court, highly, highly recommended. Um, Just, Becoming Justice Blackman is one of my favorites. Justice on the Brink is quickly becoming a new favorite. So Linda, we wish you the best of luck with this book, Justice on the Brink, The Death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, The Rise of Amy Coney Barrett, and 12 Months That Transformed the Supreme Court. Thank you to the audience for your terrific questions. Um, they were fantastic and really added to the discussion. And we are very grateful for our partners in today's event, NYU's John Bradamus Center and the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network at NYU School of Law. I'm Melissa Murray, and with a quick note from the Brennan Center before we leave you, you can stay up to date on key issues impacting our democracy with weekly analysis and insights from Brennan Center experts. All you have to do is sign up for the briefing newsletter at brennancenter.org slash briefing. And you can also register for all of the great events at the Brennan Center, including Brennan Center live events at brennancenter.org slash events. Thank you all for attending tonight and for supporting the Brennan Center and its terrific work. Thank you.